Hey guys, in this video I'm just going to talk you through the uh, the info screen on the Nikon D5100. Uh, it's very similar to the other uh, sort of budget bodies. Uh, there's a few slight differences, but if you've got something like the uh, D3200 or 3100, it should be uh, pretty much the same. So to get to the menu, first of all, uh, press the I button, if you've got one, or the info button, and that will bring up this screen that you see here. To get into all the menu functions that you can see down there on the side, press the I button or the info button again, and that will bring you into this screen. Okay, the first one we've got here is image quality. If you click OK, you can then see all the different uh, uh, file types on here and file sizes. Um, we've got rule plus F, rule plus N, rule plus B, rule, fine, normal, and basic. Okay, so that one, rule plus F, is a rule file plus a fine JPEG. So that takes two uh, files. Um, that's quite good if you're just starting out in photography and you want to play around with rule files, but you also want the backup of a JPEG file um, just in case. Um, so that's a rule file and a large JPEG in fine. That one is a rule file and a JPEG in normal. And that one is a rule file and a JPEG in basic. Um, fine, normal and basic is just the, the way the compression works. Um, the fine is obviously going to be a bit more detailed. Uh, the normal not so much and the basic is a smaller basic image. Just raw on its own. And then you've got just fine, just normal and just basic. You'll see also here as I scroll through them, uh, the file size and the number of images that I can get onto this card changes. So on the basic you can see it takes up 2.3 megabytes per image and I could get 2.7 thousand images and you can see that change as I go up. Uh, raw as you can see it's 22 megabytes per image and I can only get 289 and then you can see the raw and the JPEGs there as well. So pick whichever one of those you want, I personally shoot in raw um, if you shoot in RAW, the next option will actually be greyed out. you see it will go straight down to white balance. Um, so if we just go into JPEG there, you've then got another set of options, large, medium or small. That is just the image size. Um, at large, you've got the full resolution and obviously the image files are going to be a lot bigger. And you've got medium and small. I'd always recommend shooting at the largest you can. Um, you can always make an image smaller. Um, it's a lot harder to make an image bigger, so I would keep that on large all the time unless you know for a specific shot you only need a small image and you're never going to want a bigger image of that uh, particular photo. So my settings are on RAW so I get the full size anyway. Next up we've got white balance, uh, you've got auto, incandescent, cool white fluorescent, direct sunlight, flash, clarity, shade and a preset manual. Um, Again, it's up to you. Because I shoot in RAW, I tend to leave this on auto, and I will fix it in post-production afterwards. Um, there's some people that say that's lazy and cheating and all this kind of thing. It's easier, to be fair. Um, I don't need to bother with it. I can just sort it out afterwards on the computer. It's one less thing to worry about. If you're shooting in JPEG, um, you will want to set your white balance properly, um, because it's a lot harder to sort out um, afterwards in uh, post-production. So there's all the different options there. Choose the one that most suits the type of light that you're in. Next up is ISO sensitivity. Uh, the D5100 goes from the base ISO of 100 all the way up to high 2. Uh, these high settings I try and avoid if you can. Um, they're not uh, actual, actual settings. They're kind of digitally enhanced settings. So they're not brilliant. Um, so I, I wouldn't go any higher than 6400 if you can avoid it. Obviously the higher the ISO, the noisier the image is going to be, um, but the D5100 actually does pretty well. Um, I've been shooting quite high ISO, uh, very impressed with it. Um, for outside in sort of normal sunshine, 100 is absolutely fine, try and leave it as low as you can. Um, if it's a bit more overcast, maybe 200 to 400, you can see mine was on 400 there because I was shooting uh, last uh, yesterday evening and it was a bit overcast. Um, so that's the ISO. Next is the uh, release mode. Um, this is basically how many shots will fire off when you press and hold the shutter button. That's obviously single frame so for each press of the shutter it takes one photo. 
Continuous means you can keep your finger pressed on the button and it will keep shooting. Uh, on this camera it's about 4 frames per second. That's the self timer. Uh, you've got option of 2 seconds there. I don't know how you change that. I think that's in the other menu. Uh, you can usually change that up to about 10 seconds. Uh, delayed remote. If you have a remote control you can actually delay the amount of time that the camera fires after you press the remote button. That's set at 2 seconds. Quick response remote means when you press the remote button the camera will fire instantaneously. And you've got quiet shutter release. Um, what this does it delays the return of the mirror after you've taken the shot and it makes it a tiny bit quieter. Uh, it's not much quieter really, it's just a, a longer process. Uh, usually when you press the shutter the mirror flaps up, picture is taken and the mirror comes straight down again and you get that kind of noise. Um, with quiet mode all you get is a then a brief pause and then the mirror comes down and you get a ch, ch afterwards so it's not really any quieter it's just more drawn out so it's kind of a the same noise over a longer period if you like uh, so I'm going to put that back onto continuous next down is focus mode here we have several options we've got auto servo AF and this is kind of the do everything mode um, the camera supposedly chooses if the subject is moving or if it's still Personally, I don't really trust it. I'd rather tell the camera what my subject is doing. By all means, leave it in that mode if you want. It does quite a good job of it, but sometimes it will get confused. Uh, AFS is single servo. Use that when you've got a subject that's not moving or not really moving much, like landscapes. Uh, you can use that in portraits, uh, macro work, stuff like that. AFC is continuous servo, so the camera is always focusing continuously when you've got your finger half pressed on the shutter. So that is perfect for moving objects, as you can see the little picture of the surfer guy there. Um, so do that for sports stuff, pets, um, all sorts of anything that's moving really, and the camera will keep tracking the focus. And manual focus, uh, select that if you want to use manual focus for like macro work. Uh, I usually usually leave mine on AFS most of the time unless I'm doing something where I know I need AFC. Next one is AF area mode. You've got two options here. You've got auto area AF or single point AF. Now, personally, I would never, ever, ever use auto area AF. Basically, the camera decides what you want to focus on, and it will focus on that regardless. If it's not what you want it to focus on, then tough luck. The camera's already chosen it. Use single point AF and then you can manually select what you want the camera to focus on and it will get you the image that you want. The camera is clever but it's not clever enough to know what picture you want to take. So avoid auto area AF if you can and leave it on single point AF. Um, you've got a number of different focus points that you can choose from uh, using the direction pad so you can always get a focus point near or over your subject and uh, the camera will then focus on that. Next one is metering. We've got three options here. We've got matrix, center weighted, and spot. For everyday photography, matrix is absolutely fine. Um, the camera uses all the different segments of the metering system to decide um, what should be properly exposed. I leave it on this 90% of the time, to be honest, and it does a really good job. Um, if you've got something that's a bit more difficult, like you can see the flower there, and you're only really concerned about the uh, the metering of the flower and not the background then you can use centre weighted as long as you get the centre area over the flower the flower will then be properly exposed spot metering can be a bit more difficult to use you've got a tiny spot in the centre of the uh, of the camera that will read the exposure so if you point that at something bright it's then going to underexpose your image so only use spot metering if you really know how to use it properly um, these two do pretty much all the work. Um, as I said, I use it. I usually uh, leave it on matrix most of the time. Active delighting. This is uh, Nikon's sort of dynamic range control setting. Um, it doesn't do a great deal, to be honest. Um, I'd probably leave it on off um, because I'm shooting in RAW. It doesn't really matter. But if you're shooting JPEG, it's up to you. Um, you can just play around with it, trial the settings, leave it on auto if you want. Um, all it does is it tries to sort of bring up the shadow areas and the brighter areas um, to get a more balanced exposure. 
Um, it does okay, but it does slow the camera down somewhat. And uh, personally, it's not something that I need to use. Okay, this one is auto bracketing. This one is for all you HDR fanatics out there. Um, what this does is you can set uh, all these different exposure values, uh, and then it will take uh, you take three shots, and each shot will be differently exposed, and uh, depending on what you set it as. Um, you've got 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and one. Uh, if you set it at 0.3, the first exposure will be, um, depending how you set your menu up, will be properly exposed. Uh, the next image you take will be underexposed by 0.3, and the next one will be overexposed by 0.3. So if you're doing HDR work, uh, this is perfect for that. And you can go up to two stops under and overexposed. Um, for most of the stuff when I do HDR, I usually have it at 0.7, but it depends on the scene. Uh, again, you can play around with that. This is also good if you're not 100% sure on how to meter something. If you've got a scene that's a bit awkward and you don't know how you should be exposing for it, uh, you can set this up and then take three shots and you'll have at least three attempts at getting the correct exposure. So auto bracketing is a really good feature and perfect for HDR. Over this way we've got uh, picture controls, again because I'm shooting RAW I don't need any of these but if you're in JPEG uh, you can pick any of those that you fancy. Uh, if you use uh, Nikon software of UNX you can actually change this in the software afterwards so you can just play around with those. Uh, I'm just going to leave it on standard because I don't use it. Exposure compensation can be changed here or by the exposure compensation dial on the body. I can go minus to plus five of exposure compensation. Um, basically use this when you are in something like aperture priority or shutter priority mode. And uh, you use it when you know that the camera meter is going to be fooled by a bright or dark area. Um, if I'm shooting a picture of my dog for example, and I focus on his head, his head's quite dark. Um, and but his body is quite light so the metering system gets confused and doesn't know which part I should be or which part it should be exposing for and um, so often he comes out underexposed so if I was shooting my dog I'd put in usually plus 0.7 exposure compensation um, that then balances out his bright bits and his dark bits and his head usually comes out properly exposed it's a bit more advanced uh, once you get used to different metering modes and different metering scenes and um, you'll start using this. Uh, for the very beginners, just uh, I would just leave it alone for now until you sort of figure out what you're doing. Just play around with it on different shots. Uh, next over, we've got flash compensation. That does pretty much the same thing as exposure compensation, except this time you're changing the output of the flash. Uh, so you can actually change the power of the flash using this. Uh, again, just that's just for the pop-up flash. Uh, an external flash will have its own settings. So you can go brighter or darker on any given scene using your uh, pop-up flash. And the next one along is flash mode. Uh, you've got red eye reduction, red eye reduction with slow curtain, just slow curtain and rear curtain and normal flash. Okay so red eye reduction obviously um, reduces red eye, it, flash, uh, it fires a a very quick pulse of light just before the actual exposure which uh, makes the pupils open up and stops uh, the red eye because the red eye is a reflection uh, in the eye. It's good but often it can confuse people because they see the, the first flash and they think you've taken the photo um, so sometimes they sort of turn around um, but it does a good job. Slow curtain is uh, a good uh, mode for doing portrait photography at night and what this does, it actually forces the camera to use a slower shutter speed. And uh, that means that you can get the ambient lighting from the background from the actual exposure. And the flash will illuminate the foreground. Um, so you get uh, the flashlight will sort of expose for the subject. And the ambient light will then expose for the background. And that's with red eye. And that's the same. And then rear curtain, that fires a flash at the end of the exposure. Um, so you get these kind of weird trails going on um, because you've had the exposure and the ball's moved and then the, the flash fires and freezes the other bits. So you get these cool light trails 
Um, if you're doing like nightclub work and stuff like that and you want those funky uh, lights and people moving, uh, then you can use the rear curtain. Okay, that's it for the, uh, the menu in here. I'll do another video of the proper menu system another time. But uh, until then, I hope this was helpful and I'll see you all soon.